So please just continue. I'll get this one through really quickly then. And, and, and basically, I just wanted to do this one because this is a paper I gave at the, uh, at the uh, Alta conference in, in Australia. Is everyone online? Yes. And it, it's one of the best conferences in the world for hydrometallurgy and battery materials and whatnot. And uh, I got invited by the, uh, the, the run of Alan Taylor, who runs this conference. And he was, I've known him for years and years. And he said, you know, you, Paul, you, you need to come to, to tell the story of these horizontal autoclaves because you work for all three. And uh, there's not going to be anywhere around to tell the story. If you, so I, I agreed to do it. And I just, uh, I'll quickly go through this. It, it, it's a bit repetitious from the owner, but you know, the, care and plan, it was, nickel was a war material. Uh, the Korean War pushed the HPAL development at MOA by Freeport, although Sherritt was the, was the technology provider. Uh, the various projects, this is the beginnings of the, is the, the various care and plants were built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, in 76 to 86, the Russians built a copy of the, uh, of the Nicaro plant that the Americans had built. They built a reversed engineered plant in MOA, still operating. So they started a, another plant in, in MOA, Cuba, another Karen plant by the Russians. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was suspended in 91. So this is the part of Cuba we're talking about. This is uh, Far East Cuba. The trade winds come from the northeast, and uh, which is what which forms laterite deposits in the tropics, and you get a lot of a uh, lot of rain uh, that dissolves the nickel and re-precipitates it. Uh, and these are just the the five different mines that are being either operating now, have operated, or planned. Uh, so they're all in this belt, eastern Cuba laterite mining. We talked about this. So, so the Karen process we talked about before, so I won't waste any time. So the timeline in the 90s was very interesting. First of all, the Soviet Union broke up in 91, which that Las Camarillas plant was canceled. 93, they discovered Voise's base, sulfoid nickel deposit in uh, Labrador. In 94, the Sherritt and Cuba Nickel formed an economic association to, uh, to operate Moa Nickel. Uh, kind of using modern management styles. 94, we also started the feasibility study for four different uh, horizontal autoclave, Goro, Anaconda, Belong, and Cause. The ABC projects were all in Western Australia. Big uh, uh, breakthrough in 95, Western Mining, which is now uh, Nickel West BHP, committed a, to a new acid plant at the Calgary Nickel Smelter, which meant that acid would be available for Bulong and Cause. 95, Inco completes the purchase of Voise's Bay sulfide nickel deposit. And if anyone remembers those days, it was an enormous price. Um, this was the last camera I opus and those cranes sat there for about 15 years before, I don't know if they fell down or whether they were taken down, but the plant was almost commissioned and they are almost completed. And then the Russians one day were not there. So this is a one I found from an old Inco newspaper. And the idea of paying such a big price for Voise's Bay was to kill those three projects in Western Australia in the bud, nip it in the bud. And they made a definitive statement that they're in the nickel business. And unfortunately, they started detailing the ABC projects anyway in 96. Uh, I worked on Beulong the most, and I know the economics. It was not an economic project. It was a it was a crap shoot that the nickel price would would go up, and the cobalt in those days was a, was a nuisance product. We had to produce it because we couldn't waste it, but the cost of producing nickel or cobalt exceeded the price you could get for it. So in '96, all three projects started at the same time. All the autoclaves were built in the same shop in Adelaide. Uh, Inco put their foot in the water a little bit gingerly. They only uh, built a demonstration plant at Goro. Didn't help, the full plant was still a disaster. Um, WMC, they went to Cuba and they, they, they started looking at Pinar's de, de Mayeri in, uh, in Cuba, really bullish. 
Cause and Bue Long were commissioned in 98 and 99 with Zanaconda Mer Merin operations. And then the start of the definitive feasibility study for Goro Nickel wasn't until these plants were already commissioned. And as I mentioned in the previous, the uh, Goro Nickel is a 270 and these are 250. It's, it sounds like only 20 degrees, but in the pressure, if you look at the saturated steam curve, you're going from like 45 bar to, to you know, up to 70 bar. Not quite 56 bar, which is a lot. So this is when the engineering was so Anaconda Nickel was the first one off the block. The, the engineers were, were fluid annual. They went with a full four trains, six compartments, seven agitator autoclaves, front compartment, tie one. They went the whole, they didn't put a gas scrubber in. We never understood how they could get away with that because we were in the same city dealing with the same government officials and they had our feet to the fire what our scrubber emissions would be. And Anaconda didn't have one. So design production was supposed to be 45. But again, as I said, when that question is to, 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 to predict uh, uh, production is, is really, really a dodgy thing because it's the volume and how much volume and how much uh, nickel and what recovery, that's what telling you how much you're gonna produce. So there's a very simplified of, uh, of Anaconda. They went with a bottom entry. Another disaster, bottom discharge, another disaster. Um, not enough interstage feed pumps. A lot of things that didn't go well on that. Uh, Bue Long was, was, was Kilborn, Bateman Tinhill, Kilborn with an Australian partner, single six compartment autoclave, no double front, which was a share of patent at the time. We went with a multiple, uh, multiple point uh, acid injection system with tantalum valves. We worked with tantalum valves with uh, valve technologies in Houston, Texas to design a valve strictly for this service. And we'll be doing more on this later. Because we were using hypersaline water, we needed palladium stabilized titanium, which was TIE 17, four stage letdown, high energy venturi gas scrubber. And again, its design production was 9,000. And this was our, our office in Perth, Australia. There were seven Canadians from Toronto. Uh, among about 60 Australians, and we were doing the autoclave. Uh, not very many friendly faces. A B long autoclave, very simplified, four stages let down, four stages of heating. Double stage centrifugal for the, for, the, for the third stage and triple stage centrifugal for the fourth stage, which is what Anaconda eventually had to do as well. The system that was designed with the business done. And there's just another version of, uh, of the Belong with that scrubber. Uh, TIE 17, as I said on this one, uh, when we were doing these projects, there was no internet. You had to go down to University of Toronto with a lot of coins in your pocket and, and you'd get stuff and you'd copy it. And again, TIE, TIE only went to TIE 12. And this was in 1994. They started with the newer grades. So that was a repeat contact theater. So, Again, this was another Kilborn innovation that we did is because we had was these open-ended blast tubes. And the downside of that is you got no back pressure on that letdown valve. So, so the, the letdown valve has a hard life, but you, you're, you're open-ended here. Whereas the cause uses a close-end uh, blast tube, which puts your back pressure on that, but causes all kinds of other issues. So I, I wanted to take a shot at that. There's these we had the flash vessels built uh, in Quinana in Australia. And they're identical to what we had built in Salt Lake City. And one of the things with Kilbourne, if you see white flash vessels and heaters, it's a Kilbourne plant. It's uh, just something that we always did. Um, so Cause Nickel was Davy Minproc joint venture. It's the same autoclave basically as Kilbourne. It was used tie eleven. They only used two-stage letdown, but they had a different reason for that. Also had a scrubber. The reason they used two stages, they were going to use waste heat for an ammonia releach, uh, ammonia recovery. So there's a there's a bleed of their their, their uh, atmospheric uh, flash steam, which meant they only needed two stages. So that was some of but they the innovation they had is scaling in an autoclave with acid injection is a huge issue. And if you get too much scaling, you don't get enough retention time, you don't get leaching. So they had this idea of using one reactor to scale up while they were cleaning the other one. And it was a great idea in principle, but in practice, 
it wasn't deemed safe to go into a into a pressure vessel and clean it with an operating pressure vessel right beside you and sitting over top of an operating autoclave. So that that was a never was copied again. And again, the low the closed end blast tube was a Davy thing used at Dudley here. Anything with the Davy project, they uh, they use these closed end. The disadvantage of those, if you get low flow, you get three phase flow in here, flashing, and then you get an enormous damage. So the commissioning started in 98. Cost commissioning was the first. First thing that they noticed was the titanium liner was cracking and stress. So they, 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 the Australian Submarine Corporation came and said, no, we got to cycle these, hot cycle them four or five times. They had issues with chrome, chromite precipitating. And they they bogged they put very low power on their agitators, which is one of the reasons they got bogging. Acid reactors, you know, they didn't work. Issues with the bottom entry, that wasn't such a bad. But they had no issues with their piston diaphragm. Few long, we had lots of issues there. They were the first ones with the ZBM 900s. <clears throat> this was a high temp heater, which we see didn't work. That was a big failure. And because we used elastomers in the liners instead of not taking into consideration the much hotter temperatures, we were sold a product called foam glass that was supposed to take care of it. It didn't work. So we fixed that by just using weld overlay and it's done. So there's a, a B-Long autoclave, white, again, white pressure, a nice white plume from the scrubber. Everything's not covered in red mud. So it's, it's a good looking plant. Uh, the anaconda is uh, had the same issues with the stress cracking and the chromite precipitating. Their power was really low. If you go back to Bulong, we put lots of power. We put 110 kilowatts on the first three and 55 on the last. Never had any issues with chromite. But we did have an issue with that corrosion. So 37, uh, they had problems with the titanium. They didn't put wear plates. Uh, multi-stage uh, system due to reverse flow that failed. We had to replace it. Uh, uh, alloy 59 acid valves that didn't they failed didn't work. Bottom entry failed didn't work. Issues with airborne emissions due to lack of scrubber. Well, you saw the pictures in the first one. Everything covered in red. Uh, so uh, these are these are my as a commissioning engineer in 1999. We all got uh, these little little can of briquettes and of the first production. And this was a little uh, reproduction of the actual packaging of anaconda, nickel, cobalt, and nickel briquettes. One of the things I thought was funny is that when you do your training, they give you a stubby holder to keep your beer cold. I don't think they do that anymore. But uh, we, when I told them we our camps are dry in Canada, they don't believe you. But, so th this is my field notes that I still have of how to fix the acid injection problem. And we were very lucky that, uh, that Bulong was very good enough to loan us one of their valves that had been bought. And now one valve was used. The delivery was about 11 weeks, 12 weeks for new tantalum ball valves. We had to order eight, sorry, nine, one to pay back Bulong and, and two for each train. And this is the system that's in there now. So the aftermath after 2000, they built more. Goro went ahead, uh, Rio Tuba in the Philippines, Ravensthorpe, Taganito in the Philippines, Ramu in Papua New Guinea, Mbadavi in Madagascar, Virtus Nicol in Turkey, and there's the new QMBH Pell complex in Indonesia, and this is the one we like. Uh, also Coke in Cuba, uh, uh, Sherrod and Cuban nickel expanded uh, the, from the original 32,000 ton a year uh, nickel and mixed sulfides to 48,000, which included two new h -Pal trains with five Pachuca reactors and a new 2,000 ton a day sulfuric acid plant. It was partially completed and suspended during the GFC in 2008. So train, this is train six. It got partially, uh, the five Pachucas are there. Three of them, were, uh, one was bricked. One was partly bricked. The uh, piston diaphragm pumps were, were delivered and sitting there. They're still there. This is Gertis Nickel. Again, this is this is generation four of Bulong, but it's the same layout. Autoclave there, preheaters there, flash vessels there. 
keyhole pumps out front. So this is the new one out in Indonesia. And the first thing we saw that was the white uh, heater and flash vessels. And this is the Chinese and they've copied Beelong and uh, the two keyhole pumps. It was, if, it, if you look at the layout, I had this in the other thing. If you look at that layout from the very first uh, barrack phase one, because it's basically the same as barrack phase one, three stage. They've taken that design from 1989 and are building it today. Now, for my old team, half of the half of the team is is is, is really angry that the Chinese have copied us, and half the team, like myself, are thrilled that they copied us. They didn't copy Goro. They didn't copy Embatavi. They didn't copy Ravensor. They copied Bilong. And this is the uh, this is the Bilong PNID from 1996. And this is the Chinese one. And wow, they're really, really similar. So we're out of time. Um, I just wanna send, this is, from, this is from Alta, this is the keynote address uh, last, last year. The, the last in-person conference they had for this is, I like this one. In, in New York, 1900, there were no cars. And in 1913, in New York, there were no horses. So we're not using nickel as a as an armor anymore. We're kind of using it for this guy's the lithium ion battery, and it's nine parts uh, nickel, one part manganese, and one part cobalt. And this is pretty well the standard that the world's going to go to on the lithium iron. So with nickel, you've got uh, very, very deep uh, sulfide mines, no new uh, deposits found since 1993 and uh, lots of laterites. So I think the uh, finish, you know, I'm finished. Yeah, yeah, that's, that was it. Uh, so I did rush through that one day to make up the time, but uh, a lot of it was covered in the first presentation anyway, but I just thought I'd repeat this and it was presented at Alta 2019. And it was very well received because uh, no one had ever done that and documented it. And no one had ever been to all three sites because I worked for all three companies and uh, shared and on, worked on Coral Nickel. So the first five HPAL in the world, I've worked on them in some capacities. I hope that uh, could share that with you tonight and uh, I'm very happy to, to share this. This is a, uh, you know, and the Fleur Daniel team was all based in Vancouver. So two of the three teams were, were Canadians in, in, in Perth, Australia, working on, on this. Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Paul. For we, have a, we have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, Susan was asking, you've mentioned that there have been no new um, well, sulfide deposits, nickel sulfide deposits found since 1993 with Voises Bay. Could you speak about this a bit? What do, what do you think this says about the future? Well, I, I believe the future is ladder right now. There are some, some sulfides, but they're not, they're not the, the Voises Bay class. There's, there's, I think it's called Tanaka, it's in uh, Tanzania. It was Falkenbridge and, uh, and Barrack. And now somebody in London has taken it over and it's a sulfide. But it's not as massive as as uh, as Voises Bay, and it's not very well defined. Um, the ones in Cuba and Canada that are being promoted is uh, there's one near Timmins, um, Canada Nickel, um, which is a sulfide, and they want to go to the MH pre, uh, mixed hydroxides uh, battery material route rather than a mat. And uh, but their, their, their grades are like 0.23 and their recovery is 50%. I mean, that's brutal. And then turn again in BC is similar numbers. Uh, now we got to, we don't have country risk in Canada. So that's, a, you know, that, that's, worth, uh, that's worth points in grade and recovery, but you know, those will be marginal projects. Uh, uh, and then the other one is uh, of sulfides, they're just not, they're just not the massive Sudbury type, Norils type, uh, Pentlandite that, that, that we've kind of got accustomed to, to this. Okay, so a couple more questions. Um, Robert asks, uh, what do you think is the future of nickel mining in Sudbury 
And he put a little footnote in here. Do they still remember Stomp and Tom and his song about Sudbury? Well, it's the girls are playing bingo. The boys are getting stinko. No one's worrying about Inko on a Sudbury Saturday night. <laughs> Very good. So, you know the lyrics. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, uh, the future, I think, is the future is great. Uh, the mines are getting deep. The Totten mine is their newest mine, and uh, they, you know, they're their recent rescue, and they were talking about 600 meters, uh, which is not not that deep. But uh, they are getting deeper. And with ventilation, horsepower goes up with a cube distance. So the further you got to ventilate, to, you know, it'll get expensive. Um, but it's uh, the, the certainly on the smelting side, uh, the pyrometallurgical side of things. Uh, I think Valley have done an excellent job with the, uh, the AER project. They've shut down one of the flash furnaces uh, at Copper Cliff. So their emissions now are in the 30,000 ton a year range, SO2. So they're not, they're going to have the social license to, to be able to smelt, but. You know, Coppercliff relied for a long time on Voise's Bay, which now has to be processed through Long Harbor because that's the agreement that was made by Dr. Uh, Sopko back in 1996 or four or six, that he would uh, process the ore in Newfoundland. And uh, he is processing the ore in Newfoundland without a, without a super stack. But uh, no, I think Sudbury will still be there for a long time. That ring of... Uh, there's, there's still got to be new ore bodies. They haven't started mining yet, I would think. Mm -hmm. But I really, you know, I, I'm very familiar with the Sudbury area. Um, but I don't think they're they're running out of ore anytime soon. It's just the cost of getting to it. It's getting deeper. And the deeper you go, the more costly it is. And the hotter it gets. <laughs> well, there's all that too, yeah. Okay, and Georgina has a question about um, processing um, laterite ore, she asks, what happens to the manganese from the saprolite zones? Does that get processed and refined too, or does it get sent off to the tailings pond? Well, we talked about this earlier. And, and uh, uh, plant uh, has to be very selective on uh, the mining horizon you choose because the limonite zone does transition into a, a saprolytic zone. And manganese is, is, is a problem. Manganese is a, always has to be removed, um, but it, it can be removed. But the, the, the biggest problem is magnesium uh, because it consumes acid. And uh, it not only consumes acid, but it, it produces a lot of non-condensable gas that has to be vented from the autoclave. And then when it vents that non-condensable, it takes steam with it. And steam is a huge cost of wage power. Uh, raising the steam is, uh, you know, um, it depends on how you raise the steam because if you have an acid plant, you get a lot of free steam. You get a ton and a half of steam for every ton of acid you make. You get three tons of acid for every ton of sulfur you burn. So, you, the, the, you know, the, the synergies are really good if you have your own acid plant. That's what killed B-Long and cost. They didn't have their own acid plants. But the... Uh, so the magnesium is controlled by the amount of acid you're, you're prepared to consume. And it's generally in the three to 500 kilograms a ton of acid. If you get much more over 5% man, um, a magnesium, your, your acid consumption will go up very quickly. So you tend to leave the saprolite behind and that goes to ferro-nickel because the grade of nickel is higher anyway. And, uh, and the magnesium and the manganese don't cause you as much problem in ferro-nickel. But as far as, uh, as far as the downstream refineries, it wasn't the intention of my talk, but in the downstream refineries, all the impurities are removed uh, prior to, uh, well, they use the electro winning, uh, they, they solve an extraction, cobalt two, for cobalt extraction, Cyanex 272 is, is the go-to uh, uh, cobalt extractant. And then the, uh, and then they use ammonia for uh, neutralization to stop precipitating uh, gypsum. And then, and then that goes to uh, nickel and cobalt uh, hydrogen reduction, uh, which is also in autoclaves. And it's a shared technology. 
it's not the it's not the aim of this. I'm I'm not a refinery. Uh, I'm not a refinery specialist. At, at Murrah Murrah, I spent most of the time in the refinery stealing parts for projects I had in Orr Leach. Shouldn't say that, but I did. But uh, yeah, manganese removal, Long Harbor, there's an entire plant dedicated to that. Uh, Can I ask this one, one last question? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so something I have been talking about in my lectures here at the Hillary School of Mines recently is when people say that we're gonna have a carbon neutral economy in the world, in 2050, that to me means that we're going to need a lot more metals of all types. What do you think that means for nickel mining and nickel processing? Well, so I showed you before, the 911 battery is, the, is now going to be the standard, which uses nine parts nickel to one part manganese and one part cobalt. So nickel is and Tesla has already said it must. He wants sustainable nickel. So everyone, so Canada nickel and certainly turn again uh, in BC, which I think is Giga Metals. They're the two big Canadian uh, that are pushing to make battery grades, mixed hydroxide in, the, in Canada in a sulfide uh, ore body uh, because the demand's there. Mm -hmm. And the nickel we talked about at a dinner, nickel is. is is heading very, very quickly to $10 a pound. Yeah, it was at six for the longest time. Copper is well on its way to $5 a pound. It's always been about a two to one price, two to one nickel to copper. But I'll tell you, where I've processed bulbs and nickel's a lot harder. It deserves double the price. <laughs> it deserves more. That's great. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, 8.40. Yeah, we're only a little over. Well, well done, Paul. And well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all your... your. Oh, don't end it yet. What? No, no. Oh, okay. No, don't end it yet. We're just... just cancel. Cancel? Well, push control, control Z. Can you see if anyone can respond? We're trying to still. Okay. So, Paul, um, yeah. thank you from Northern College. Oh, okay. And there's okay. a uh, little note from us, and we also have a nice oh, um, loop. Okay, thank you. Certainly didn't need to do this, but I uh, appreciate it. Uh, and here's a token of our appreciation. Yeah. And um, I, I'd like you to open this, oh, part, okay, of, sure, this yeah. part of it. This part of it. Which uh, Jen Brazil wrapped up for you. Now, you wow. may have seen that head frame in your tour of Cobalt, Ontario this morning. And I just thought I'd, I'd share this with you that um, it's something special because the, the, head, the uh, picture that Paul is looking at, it's a, a, a drawing of the townsite mine head frame. The townsite mine, I believe, was started in 1904, and it was part of the Cobalt Silver Boom that um, produced $20 billion, that's with a B, of silver and cobalt, 100 mines. And by 1912, they realized they needed to start uh, training people to work on all these mines. And that's why the Halebury Mines, the Halebury School of Mines was started in 1912 to educate people to work in the cobalt silver mines. Now that particular mine, the townsite mine, uh, my great grandfather, Joe Gardside, ran the hoist there from 1910 to 1939. So when you hang that up on the wall, you can, well, and actually my cousin Vivian says, I look like Joe Gardside, um, which is, I guess, some genetics uh, reaching across the generations. But anyway, that's- um, so you can some, Saul, if you want to hook that up into the camera. Yes. Sure. Well, for an engineer, this is, this is really special, you know. Yeah, so anyway, you can, I'll put that on your wall and think of us and, you know, uh, we'll think of you delivering this lecture, the first of the uh, Halebury School of Mines guest lectures. Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure to, to, to do this tonight. Yeah, like I say, we've got to pass this, this message on. This is Canadian. Mm -hmm. You got to be proud of it. We do. All so, right. so this concludes uh, Paul Tucker's guest lecture. And thank you very much to our audience.
for joining us tonight and all of your insightful questions. And I bid you all a good night or a good morning or a good afternoon, depending upon where you are on this planet of ours. And thanks for joining us. Okay.